Hey, Mr. Pond Balls, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk, the Pond Boss, coming at you live and in person from Hannah City, Illinois, just outside of Peoria, hanging out in the basement slash game room of Justin Herman of Herman Brothers. He's been hanging out with Nate and Justin and, and their family for the last two or three days, uh, spending some time at Giant Goose Ranch. I'd never been there before, so uh, I've been pretty excited to come hang out and talk to those guys, and we've had a big time. And, uh, Got to meet some folks, spend a little time with different folks. So uh, I thought we'd uh, talk about some of those things that have been going on. So let me see if I can get the comments going so I can see who all is checking in. Got lots of folks already checking in. One of the things I'm going to talk about is pondi bacteria and aeration. I see Trevor. Trevor's checking in. I need to be able to see my comments here on my dead gum laptop. So... There we go. Now I'm seeing everybody. I'm going to scroll up here and look a minute. Chris Arthur, Kathy Carson McDonald, Doug Cusick, James Sewell. Good to see you. Chris Arthur, let's see. Nick Kajeski, Mike Cottrell checking in. So glad to see everybody. Travis Paul Smith, I knew he'd be here. Good evening, everybody. So um, first I want to start off talking about Jeff Hoffman. I got to meet Jeff Hoffman today. Jeff is a neighbor of uh, the Herman family right up here, and he's recently gotten involved in the pond management business a little bit more. And he said, hey, would you talk about pond dye? So I said, yeah, shoot ya, heck yeah. Hey, there's Drew Hay checking in from Pennsylvania. Um, hey, and you guys know the drill. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comment section right down there. Click like, share this. To your timeline, you're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug. Say it with me, Chris Arthur. Knows how to keep hot things hot, cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it knows. And if you'll do those things, you're eligible for a drawing. Chris Ketchum, checking in from Bells, Texas. You know I'm going to ask about the newest little tot. Yep, well, you know what? We have a sweet little granddaughter, little uh, Charlotte Catherine Lusk. Um, weighing in at a paltry like eight pounds and nine ounces, and she's a living doll. There's Clint Benbo, Tom Blasdell, Wendy Heiss. You guys are playing the game. Jeff Hoffman, I just already mentioned your name. Great to meet you today. So I'm going to start off the topics. Of course, bring your questions, but I'm going to start off by talking about the things that Jeff and I talked about with Nate and Justin. And, and Jeff was pretty fervent, pretty passionate about this, and I loved it, by the way, Jeff. It was pretty fun. So... Jeff says, talk a little bit about pond dye. So what I'm gonna tell you first is how he uses pond dye. First of all, he described a, a really hyper eutrophic lake, one that had silted in over years and years and years, and a lot of that silt was organic matter. So they started aerating the lake with bottom diffused aeration, adding beneficial microbes, and what they saw was that lake started to, to compost it's organic matter and started kind of regurgitating it back up into the water column, which compromised the water quality because they had a whole bunch of planktonic algae, things like that growing. So Jeff came up with the idea of what would happen if I used a little pond dye in there. Well, he's, he uses pond dye to help mitigate the algae bloom by minimizing UV sunlight rays penetrating into the water. So the way pond dyes work is you put it in the pond, it changes it, changes color. Now, if you do too much, it looks like the tidy bowl man has been swimming in it. So don't put too much. But what uh, pond dye does is it keeps the ultraviolet rays of the sun from penetrating very far down in the water column. Without UV rays, plants don't grow. Now, you can't kill plants, you can't kill plankton, you can't kill algae with pond dye. It's inert. There's nothing in there that it can, that it, it's, that is used as a, a, as a pesticide at all, nothing in it. It's a dye. But what, when it blocks those UV rays off of the water, from the water column, it minimizes how much can grow in it. Now, it doesn't block sunlight. It just prevents as much UV ultraviolet penetration into the water. So what Jeff has been doing is using it in combination with aeration and 
beneficial microbes to help manage that plankton bloom as the water cleanses itself. Now, the way the water is going to cleanse itself, it's going to break down those nutrients, release them into the water. Something's going to grow, go through its cycles, break down to just whatever matter it can, then it flushes. So when it rains, it'll flush. So all those many years of buildup of organic matter is mitigated. And what Jeff said was for that pond, I think it was a five-acre lake, I think, Jeff, chime in if you want to. He said that, uh, that the average depth increased three feet just by doing those three things. If you want to know more about microbes, get in touch with Landon Wyatt, W-I-E-T, W-I-E-T with uh, Aquafix. Talk to him as, about it as well. So um, that's going to be my first take on pond dye. Now, I see some questions coming, so I'm going to go ahead and back up a little bit and read these questions out here. Let's see here. Holy cow, lots of questions coming in. Jeremy Duckworth from Illinois. Yep. Hey, I'm hanging over near Peoria, Jeremy. Todd Austin, Leo Gripshover. I have a three-fifths. Oh, then it, then it quit. Don Cusick, you got it. Wendy, I just added 1,500 minnows to my third acre pond yesterday. All right. Danny Matt, checking in from San Antonio. It's hard to leave the pond. It's great. Now, it looks great. You know what? I got to look at your videos and things, Danny Matt. I want to have a conversation with you probably while I'm driving here in the next couple of days. So I think you ought to write an article about what you've done because it's very, very interesting with the different things that you've done to figure out how to make your pond work so well. Trevor Fry, my alkalinity, my lake, central Louisiana is 30 parts per million. I fertilized it with water-soluble fertilizer mid-July and late July. Clarity was 81 inches. Four weeks later, it's 45 inches. Will the clarity keep dropping? Probably not. Trevor, what's going to happen with yours is your lake is limited by its alkalinity. There's enough alkalinity in there that you could probably fertilize two or three more times and not decrease your visibility. However, there's not much reason to do that now. We're at the end of August, getting ready to go into September. Pretty soon it's fall. So the, the main reason to have fertile water is to, to keep sunlight from penetrating down so deep that rooted aquatic plants can take over and to create the basis of the food chain for newly hatched baby fish which all that happened back in March, April, May, June in, in, in central Louisiana. You know, so now circling back on the dye, when you, if you use dye during the spawning season, your consequences are is that you're going to minimize the, the uh, phytoplankton bloom, which is going to take away from the food chain for newly hatched fish. So now I didn't really talk much with about this with Jeff today, but I do believe that using dye, if you want to use it, you know, before the spring, late winter to help prevent algae from growing in it, then I think that's a great idea. One thing I do, if, if I'm managing a fishery, which that's, that's what I do, I manage fisheries, fishing lakes, I want to be sure that when my newly hatched fish come off the nest, that they've got something they can eat because those little boogers, they're not, they're not that big. And their mouths are really tiny. Even, even little bitty largemouth bass have a big mouth, but it's tiny. And they have no body fat stored up. So they've got to glean what they nutrition they need out of the water column. So I like to have a healthy plankton bloom from the latter part of March, 1st of April, all the way until about the middle of June. So I don't use pond dyes during that time. However, if a fishery is not your mission and you like the color of pond dye and you don't really you want to uh, compromise having a plankton bloom, then you can sure use pond dye. Wendy says, I use my pond for irrigation. Is pond dye okay? Absolutely is. Totally okay. Because there's nothing in it that will kill anything. It's just, it's a dye. All right, let's see what Leo Gripshover says. I have a half acre pond. It was on the property when I bought it 14 years ago. The bass have never grown. They are 10 to 12 inches long. It is crappie, catfish, and bluegill. What is your suggestion? Should I start over, drain and take all the fish out? I suspect the crappie are the issue. I will tell you this, crappie are an issue. <laughs> now, good news about a half acre pond is it's easy to restart. Now, when you bought it 14 years ago and the bass haven't grown, odds are pretty high that you have 10 to 12 inch bass that are seven, eight, nine years old. So I think in a case like that, starting over can, can be a really good idea. Uh, the, the thing is, is is once, once a pond kind of reaches its, I'm not going to call it balance, I'm going to call it equilibrium, because you end up with 
Steve Lewis, Bob, time to let the younger generation take over. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, bring it on. <laughs> I'm ready for the younger generation. And you're getting kind of old, Steve, so I see why you'd say that. <laughs> Love you, man. So, um, in, 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 the, in the case of your pond, Leo, I'm going to tell you that when, the, when, when it reaches kind of an equilibrium, then the bass have a tendency to stunt. They're overeating the food chain. The food chain can't catch up. The crappie are eating, you know, newly hatched bait fishes. They're coming off the nest, so you've kind of reached a stalemate. That might even be a better word than equilibrium. So starting over a half acre pond that you've had for 14 years and the bass aren't growing, I think I'd lean toward, yeah, I'd start it over because it's not going to cost that much. You could spend a couple of hundred bucks of fish toxicant, start over, stock it with brand new fish, spend three or four hundred bucks, and in a year and a half, you'd have pretty good fishing again. Okay, let me see here. James Allen, have a question about northern versus southern largemouth bass. Fish supplier says they're basically the same genetics. Southern fish just have more months to grow, so they tend to grow larger than northern fish. See more, and vice versa, and found no difference. Thoughts? Absolutely untrue. Hey, Frank James, what's going on? There's absolutely differences in genetic strains of largemouth bass. Northern strain largemouth bass are uh, native to the northern states, and their genetic pool has got uh, the, their upsides are they're very aggressive. They grow really fast early on and they'll top out at seven or eight pounds with a few rare exceptions. Where the southern fish are Florida strain largemouth bass. They're a little bit narrower side to side. They don't grow quite as fast early on, but they'll get to be 12, 13, 14. And, and pretty much any bass you see that's 10 pounds or larger has got some Florida genetics, and geneticists have differentiated between the different gene pools of largemouth bass. So in pond management, we're focused mostly on northern strain fish and Florida strain fish because those are the ones that are propagated and used in pond management through fish hatcheries. Now there's other genetic strains of largemouth bass. I mean, there's Kentucky spotted bass. There's like five or six kinds of bass in Alabama, you know, and they're all different. So uh, uh, in Texas, Guadalupe bass, they don't get bigger than a pound and a half or two pounds. They're largemouth bass, part of the sunfish family. But yes, there is, there is a significant difference in genetics and how those fish respond based on the genetics they carry. Now, if you took a pure strain of Florida bass up here to Illinois, probably ain't gonna do very well. Plus it's illegal in Illinois because they're considered exotic. You know, and they're not gonna thrive because they don't like cold, they like it warm. Or northern strain largemouth bass, they're good with cold. You can catch them in cool water pretty easy where you're not going to catch a great big Florida strain bass without a whole lot of effort in cold water. So, that's about all I got to say about that. Good question, though. I like it. So, let's see here. Jeremy Duckworth, we live by Peoria. Great to have you here. Hey, you know what? I'm hanging out at Hannah City and then uh, going out. I spent some time in Canton today and going to be hanging out. Yeah, Mark Durham, welcome to the link. You know what? We did, did you bring your umbrella? It was 99 degrees back home in Texas, and this little storm built up just about an hour ago. It's blowing over right now. It's raining here. And it looked, uh, when I was hanging out with, with Justin's wife a while ago, she said, I'm a little worried about that storm. I got text that there's a green cloud in it. We went out and looked to see if there was a wall cloud. There, there wasn't. It had a little green in it, but not green enough to have anything spinning around in the top of it. So that was kind of fun. Uh, yes, I did bring my umbrella. Hello, Charlie Selm. Yep. There's Steve Lewis's comment again. That said, I love my Steve Lewis. Steve Lewis, Hot Springs, Arkansas, has dedicated his entire adult life to raising fish. He worked for the uh, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and spent his whole, whole adult life on a fish hatchery, propagating all kinds of fish to stock in state waters. He's also had several ponds where he's grown pure strain Florida bass. So Steve, you might wanna chime in here about the differences that you can see in Florida compared to Northern strain largemouth bass, if you want to. Cause you have, Steve has a vast amount of knowledge about that and his knowledge is practical, hands-on, doing it every day of his life knowledge. All right, Leo, you're welcome. Billy Bates, late check-in from Southern Maryland. Good to see you, Bill Russell. 
Checking in from Lower AL, Alabama. I got to get to Alabama one of these days. Harrison Davis from Georgia. Good to see you. Jeff Hoffman, Danny Mack. And remember, your perfect days are about the same. You know what? That's exactly right. You know that? I got to tell you something. Jeremy, you better get some fried chicken at Gill's. Holy cow, I think I'll check that out, see what I can find. I haven't heard that, and I haven't had supper yet. Although I did have a fun lunch. We got some boiled shrimp. I think they came out of the Illinois River. <laughs> Not really. Um, Danny Mac, you know what? I, I think I'm going to tell that story. That's a pretty cool story. You know, this is probably back in, y'all bear with me. This is a pretty cool story. and it, it's, it pertains to you at some level. Uh, back in 2004, I got a call from uh, a young biologist in upstate New York. And he, I'd written, I think, three books at the time. He'd bought those books. He'd read them. He, he, he wrote, uh, he'd read a bunch of back issues of Pond Boss. And he, he came at me with his, with his guns loaded. And he said, listen, I'm, I've been challenged by the owner here to, to grow bass larger than eight pounds. And I can't do it. I haven't been able to figure it out. I've been here almost a year. And I, I don't know how to do it. Can you help me do that? And I thought, dude, I'm a fish guy from Texas. What do I know about New York? I know nothing about New York. <clears throat> well, to make a long story short, uh, he did a great job. He sent me all kinds of information about these lakes. But I ended up going up there, and they hired me. And the guy whose place I was taking had just been fired, and he'd worked for the New York Department of Environmental Conservation for 30-plus years. In the last 10 years, he was the director of inland fisheries. So they fire that guy and hire somebody from Texas, which made me shake my head. It made me think about it. And I thought, you know what? Um, I better do something different than what he did or I'm going to get fired. And then I can't help him, you know, if I don't know what he did. So I started kind of thinking about it and I thought, okay, what's the problem? So I started calling local fisheries biologists, fish farmers, uh, fisheries professors, and invited a bunch of them to come over there to Savannah Dew for lunch. They all came over. And I said, tell me, tell me why you can't raise bass eight pounds or bigger in upstate New York. Well, it boiled down basically to three things. Genetics, the food chain couldn't grow enough food, and the growing season's too short. So I said, okay, that's the box. Now I have the box. And in order to think out of the box, you got to know what the box is. You're the same way. All of us, every one of us has a box. And if you'll, if you'll think about what that box is and define it, then you can begin to think of ways to get out of that box. Well, shortly after that, I, I'd never, I, had, I was almost 50, and I'd never put a drop of alcohol in my body. But I was fascinated with, the, with wines in upstate New York. I was fascinated with how they make them and what they did. Debbie kept saying, you know what? If you taste a little wine, you'll be okay with it. So I tasted it, and I didn't die. I got this little dizzy feeling from the first time I did it, and I thought that was kind of cool. So I started going around with the, We did a little wine tasting tour in a, in a bus, and I thought it was pretty cool. Then, then a local uh, winemaker who owned a small vineyard came up, and he was their chefs at this place back then, and he wanted to do a, a wine tasting. Well, I got there a little bit early. I'd go up there and spend two weeks at a time, fly up, Spend two weeks, work on the fisheries, then fly back to Texas. And so uh, the winemaker came in and he told this story. He said, you know, and it was fascinating. I got to hear the science behind it, all, all the fun stuff that I love. And so he said, uh, when I first bought this vineyard, he says, it, wait, it took forever for my grapes to bloom. They finally bloomed, the grapes set, and they grew so fast it scared me. And yet he's got a vineyard on one of the Finger Lakes, Cayuga Lake, at a certain elevation off the water, which makes a difference. And so he said, my grapes grew fast, they matured quick, and they got ripe way, way, way too soon, way sooner than I thought, probably three or four weeks before I thought they should. He said, but I checked the bricks, I checked the acidity, the amount of juice, the color, the skins, everything seemed perfect. So I called my mentor in Napa and told her all this. She said, well, hey, if you've got all that, pick your grapes. And he said, well, he said, it happened really fast here. And she said, yeah. And she says, here's the deal. Out here in Napa, we've got 125 perfect grape growing days spread out over a 300-day season. 
Over there, you've got 125 perfect grape growing days pretty much in a row. So I raised my hand and said, what's a perfect grape growing day? He said, when the temperature, air temperature is between about 58 and 83, 55 and 83, something like that. I thought, holy cow, that's a perfect bass growing day. So I started going back through weather records, whatever that I could find, National Weather Services stuff. And I'm going to tell you this, pretty much, I don't care where you live, you've got 125 perfect largemouth bass growing days. Just happens in New York, they're all in a row. In Texas, we, we've got to pay attention because our water gets too hot. And if the water gets too hot, then bass aren't going to grow. They're going to be trying not to die when it's hot. So that took one, that took one of the pieces out of that box for me. So then it came down to genetics and it came down to food chain. So on that property, they had a bunch of little hatchery ponds that they weren't using. So we kicked those hatchery ponds in gear. We got some feed train largemouth bass, got with Purina Mills, and they started making a little bit better fish foods. So we started feeding some of these fish, growing more bait fish, and within 18 months, we were really on a trajectory to grow some bass well over eight pounds, and it, it happened. So that's what Danny Mac's talking about, and I think that's a pretty good story. There's Chuck Brinkman over there from, uh, matter of fact, I'm up north of you now, or northeast of you, Chuck. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. James Allen and Bob, this 80-acre Kentucky lake has been stocked two times per year with largemouth bass. We see everything from fried and nine-pounders. What will be logical sizes for culling? All right, I'll tell you what, I will, I'll tell you this. Uh, if any of you don't have my spreadsheet on plugging in links and weights of your bass to compare to standard, send an email to info at pondboss.com and I will send you that spreadsheet. But what you do, James, is you start weighing and measuring fish. And after some period of time, there will be a slot of fish. And typically, it's bass 12 inches to 15 inches after the third year. Those are the fish whose growth rates begin to level off. And those are the ones that you need to cull. But culling is also based on your goals. If you want a balanced fishing lake, and you're going to be harvesting fish along a balanced scale of length compared to weight. All right, so what I mean by that is if you'll weigh and measure fish and compare your fish to the standards for that species, since we're talking about bass, for example, a 10-inch bass should weigh 10 ounces. A 12-inch bass should weigh 12 ounces. 14-inch bass should weigh 1 pound 7 ounces. A 16-incher is 2 and a quarter. An 18-incher is 3 and a quarter. And on an XY graph, there's a curve that looks like that when you compare lengths to weights. And you can weigh and measure your fish and compare them to the standards as long as they're within 5% of that standard length compared to the weight, then they're doing fine. Now, here's how to interpret that. If you catch a bass and it's fat, throw it back. If you catch a bass that's skinny, take it out. But if you'll be proactive and weigh and measure those fish before they start getting skinny, the fish are going to tell you what size classes are the ones that are underperforming or beginning to run out of food. And that's the answer for that. Clint Benbow, thoughts on stocking threadfin shad in an existing four and a half acre lake in North Cagalac? How cold does the water temperature have to be in the winter to kill a shad? Uh, my thoughts about stocking a four and a half acre pond? I love threadfin shad. Threadfin shad die at 42 degrees. I cannot tell Nate Herman to stock threadfin shad out here in these these lakes in Illinois, they're gonna die. You know, now it might be a good bang for the buck in some cases, cause you get one year's worth of reproduction out of them, but here they're not native, you know, and over in North Carolina, they'd be fine. Uh, they're gonna die at 42 degrees. If they've got 42 degree water for 30 minutes, they turn into little bitty silver popsicles and they're done. You know, now here's the caveat. If you're gonna stock any fish at all, you need to make sure that you've got the right circumstances. In that, I mean, you've got to have what I call happy water. You've got to have the right kind of habitat, the right kind of food chain, the proper genetics for your latitude, you know, and then there's, with game fish, you got to have a harvest program. So there in uh, uh, North Carolina, your water is probably tea-colored. Threadfin shad or filter feeders. If they don't have a good plankton bloom, like we were talking about a while ago, if I was going to grow threadfin shad, that's part of my mission, is I'm not using pond dye. I want that algae bloom. I want that plankton bloom because I want those threadfin shad to have all they can eat. 
and I'm measuring visibility there. And if I do think I want to mitigate a plankton bloom, I'm probably with and, and I've got threadfin shad, I'm probably not going to use pond dye for that. I'll probably use an algae side. But typically, if you've got threadfin shad and you've got a good plankton bloom, you're going to grow way, way, way more threadfin shad than you think. Now, threadfin shad, their primary role in a bass fishing lake is to feed the young bass. 12 to 15 inch bass are going to come up and chase those little bitty shad when they're about an inch and a half, two inches long. You know, so I think in North Carolina, threadfin shed are a great idea as long as your bass are not overcrowded to eradicate them too fast. They've got good for fertile water for them to, uh, to be able to feed. Now, this is probably the wrong time of year. If you have any risk of the water temperature getting down to 42 degrees, threadfin shed are pretty well past their spawning period. I don't know that they'd spawn one more time in North Carolina. They might, but I doubt it. You know, so I would look at doing them in the spring if you can find a source. That's kind of that's kind of a catch-22 in North Carolina. Dave Weber, <coughs> good evening to you, sir. Um, oh, and the existing fish stocking rate with shad. Uh, if 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 the bass numbers are low, I'd say anywhere in a four and a half acre lake, I'd put ten thousand in it. That's what I'd do, or one load, however much that is. Some of the shad dealers sell them by the load which means they can load so many pounds, but they don't ever tell you the count because they might be that long or they might be that long. And if they're that long, you know, they're, they weigh three times as much as the others. You get fewer head count, but you get mature fish. So they're typically not gonna tell you how many fish you're getting. They're gonna, you're gonna get so many pounds of fish, they can estimate about how many. You know, so one load might be 10,000, it might be 15,000, it might be 8,000. It just depends on how big the shad are. Hey, Jackie Woody, good to see you. Yep. Hey, uh, Dave Weber, I was kind of toying whether to come through Kansas City on my way up to Iowa, but I ended up going over and going up through Lebanon, Missouri, and going north from there. Jackie Woody's, hello. By the way, after six weeks, I'm finally able to get the large nugget pure and aquamax largemouth food. Fun to watch the turtles and small fish look at it and can't figure out how to eat it. Yep, that's pretty cool. However, channel cats suck it down. Seems to work well to feed the nuggets and then the MVP. You know what? I, I love the fact that you're trying to mix it up with the way that you're feeding your fish. I think that's a smart idea. I do. Uh, I mean, I never really thought of a feeding program until Purina Mills started making a variety of sizes of fish foods. And then it clicked with me. You can feed small fish, small fish food. You can feed big fish, big fish food. You know, so you can actually have a feeding program. So at Richmond Mill Lake over in... Uh, Near Laurenburg, North Carolina, Laurel Hill, North Carolina. That's where we first started doing a feeding program. We found the shallow areas where bluegill spawn, moved off adjacent to that, and that's where we fed, um, I think it was 400, Aquamax 400, little bitty pellets. And then out where we we're feeding bigger bluegill, we switched them over to 500. And then where we we're feeding largemouth bass, those they got the Aquamax largemouth bass nuggets. So it's a, a, it's a feeding program. I like a feeding program. Now, one thing I was talking to Nate and Justin about, they're real skeptical about feeding fish in too many ponds here. And I totally concur with it. I get it. Now, they're going to feed some fish where they can control the water quality. However, in, in these northern areas, like where I am now and further north even, if you feed the fish, you got to pay attention to it so you don't put more feed in there than what the water can process the fish waste in any uneaten feed. And they're going to convert this feed, like Aquamax MVP, they're going to convert that feed about 1.3 to 1. So even in now feed trials, when you're feeding only fish food, the conversion rates are a little bit less <coughs> because they need energy to, uh, to live. Whereas out in a pond or a lake, 1.2, 1.5 is pretty normal. So 1.2 pounds of fish food is going to grow a pound of fish, but you got a quarter of a pound of fish waste. The water's got to process that. And they have this deal up here called winter, where in Texas we have this thing called summer. So in the winter, you run the risk, especially in a small pond, of winter kill. Okay, so let's see what Brian Epting says. Holy cow, it's already 7 o'clock. This thing flies by. You guys come up with some great questions, great topics. All right, let's see here. Um... I was going to circle back on something that already, it's escaped me. Oh, I know what I was going to do. I <laughs> thank the sponsors. Texas Hunter Products. 
Uh, I shot a video with Nate today. You guys can watch it on the Pond Boss Facebook page where they've got a little pond that they, that they manage for one 24-hour event every year on September the 11th. Um, it's called the Marathon Man, and they do a 24-hour broadcast. The guy tries to catch the same number of fish as people that were lost at 911. You know, over 2,400 fish. And he tries to catch that many fish in 24 hours. And I did the math, that's 100 fish an hour. That's more than one fish a minute. You know, and then they video it, or actually they, they, they show it live for 24 hours. And um, so they've got this pond where they really got it overcrowded with bluegills and six different kinds of sunfish. But uh, in that pond, they're going to feed those fish like crazy. It's small. They can flush the water out. Uh, they got a Texas Hunter feeder. And I love Texas Hunter feeders. Texas Hunter is great products. Their, their products are not only good or great, their customer service is great. I can call Chris Blood or email any of those guys there, and they respond immediately. And if I get it to them before about 2 in the afternoon, they ship that day because they have everything in stock. Also, thank Purina Mills for being a sponsor for this show. I'm honored to have been able to have some input into how they develop their feeds. Going all the way back to 1995, they saw this pond management niche as an industry that they wanted to support. And the best way they could support it is help develop fish foods. So they've spent a lot of time. As a matter of fact, I spent some time last week at Texas A&M talking with their nutritionists as well as david nelson and the nutritionist from purina and they're talking about maybe collaborating on on some empirical research at the university along with the research that they're doing at the purina farm in grace summit missouri so i love the fact that, that they're that they research these feeds you know now every company's got their hiccups but when it comes to feeding fish in our niche purina mills does a good job of that and and i love aquamax mvp especially for where you have different sizes of different species of fish. Al Glackoff, where in upstate was I? I was outside of Clyde, New York, between Rochester and Syracuse, in the Finger Lakes, north of 90, north of the 90. That's where I was. You can look at it on Google Earth, look over uh, kind of northeast of Clyde. You see a lake shaped like an H and a whole bunch of lakes in that general vicinity. That's where I was. I was there for about two years. Tom Blasdale, please talk some about the Ask the Boss question in the July-August issue of Pond Boss concerning the use of Foslock to control algal blooms. That's a great idea. I'm glad you brought that up, Tom. There was a, a question that came from a, a former Pond Boss subscriber that's renewed his subscription, by the way, who had moved to an East Texas lake, and they've got, uh, it's Holly Lakes, where he is now, and they've got a significant blue-green algae bloom going on. So the question was, we're, we can't make up our mind whether to use an algicide to kill the blue-green algae or use Foslock to kill the blue-green algae. Well, here's the way that works. Blue-green algae is a consequence of several factors coming together. So when you've got what looks like green paint that's been spilled on the surface or blue-green looking paint, you've got blue-green algae and it's, it's common. But when it gets to a certain level, it's got toxins, and it, when those cells die and they break loose, they release the toxins, and it can kill dogs. It can make people sick. You know, in, in, in the, in the uh, flyover ag states, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, where there's a lot of, you know, ag farms going on, a lot of farming going on, you see a lot of blue-green algae in that area, and it's mainly because there's an imbalance between nitrogen and phosphorus dissolved into the water. When that happens, and blue-green algae, it typically happens this time of year from um, mid-June on until the water starts to cool off. And sometimes it happens in the winter, but not nearly as severe. But what happens is, because there's an imbalance between nitrogen and phosphorus, the phosphorus is, is concentrated higher, it really, really fuels that blue-green algae. Now, in a, in a good, healthy environment where those nutrients are balanced, the good algae can outcompete the blue-green algae, which is a bacteria, by the way. It's not even an algae, it's a bacteria. And so what happens is when the blue-green algae gains a foothold, it can really take off and create its own circumstance to eliminate competition. So it can consume a lot of phosphorus, 
It can even fluctuate the temperature within a few inches of the water, which gives it a better chance to grow. It migrates toward the sunlight. You know, so the question was about Foslock. Foslock is basically alum mixed with um, lanthanum. And when you mix it in the water, it's, it's, it has a chemical reaction that's like a magnet that grabs that phosphorus and causes it to sink to the bottom and get embedded in the lake where it can't be used. So it, it binds it. But the problem with using Foslock is once that blue-green algae is growing, it's using the phosphorus. Foslock can't get to it. So the Q&A there was, and the answer was, you got to get rid of the blue-green algae and then use Foslock to change the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus. And so when you can get that phosphorus level down by sequestering it with Foslock, sinking it to the bottom and embedding it in the mud where it can't come back up into the water column and be used again, then you can, then you can balance the water to prevent blue-green algae and stop it. So it's not used to control algae blooms. It's used to eliminate phosphorus from the water. That's what Foslock does. And for more information on that, you can check in with CPRO and see what's going on there. Okay, let's see here. Doug Brown, September 9, 2020. Almost a year ago, I stocked 75 ounce hybrid striped bass. I haven't caught one as of yet. Getting electric shocking done isn't in the budget this year because I'm building a house. Dude, I get that. In the moment, and at the moment, wife keeps adding things to her list. I get that. I got that list today. It's in my text. Whew. Okay, so let's see who has the finishes. Budget Buster. Thinking about adding a few hybrid in my fall stocking program this year. You're not saying how big your pond is. Any place that has pellets, feed, hybrid striped bass near Georgia. Um, you know what? Call, call Edges Pond Management. Call Greg Grimes. Greg Grimes is a um, sponsor of this show, Aquatic Environmental Services. Check with Greg. Also, go to pondboss.com and across the menu at the top, look for resource guide. Click on the resource guide and you'll see several categories and you'll see who some of the fish suppliers are. You can also talk to American Sport Fish Hatchery in Montgomery, Alabama, but uh, go to the resource guide and you'll see two or three people there that can get you some hybrid striped bass. Most of those hybrid stripers come out of Arkansas, so uh, a lot of the fish farms will go buy them and then resell them or some of them will buy some, will grow them up bigger and then, and then resell them from their hatcheries. So there are several places you can do that. Hello, Chris Chavetta. I may be running through St. Louis here in a couple days, but I'll be passing through, I think. David Schneiderman, Easy Docks of Texas. If you're looking for a dock and you don't want to drive a whole bunch of posts into the ground, check in with David. Troy Todd. You guys remember that drill? Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like. Share this to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat. In the Pond Boss mug that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it knows. Hey, Pond Boss Magazine. Look here. $35 a year. You know, it, it, I'm not real good at trying to sell stuff, but I'm going to try to push this on you just a little bit. $35 bucks a year. We spent more than that for lunch for three people today, and it's going to be gone in another few hours. So, cheaper than a Friday night date, and this lasts a year. Lots of nuggets in this that you can actually use. So, uh, go to pondboss.com, click on subscribe. 35 bucks. That's what helps fuel the economy so I can do these shows. Well, kind of. I mean, I'm going to do it anyway, but it would be great if you guys jumped on board. And you know what? Um, Chris Blood will be on here in a little bit. He'll chime in and say, hey, Bob, tell him about the Institute of Higher Pondology. Okay, I'll do that. Uh... Several months ago, I worked with Chico, Mike Garcia, Chico we call him, and he's a great videographer. He helped me put together some videos. Uh, we videoed one of the Institute of Higher Pondologies that we had at Lusk Lodge, Comma 2 a couple of years ago. And we edited through those videos, and now we've got 22 videos up for sale, premium content. But how, here's how I justify selling the videos. There's premium content that you're not going to find online that pertains to what you want to do with a pond or a lake. So, I'm going to suggest that you take a look at that. Uh, 
It's uh, pondboss.teachable.com, and you can find it there. So we've got six different pods for six different prices. And the, the whole premise of that is to help new landowners keep from paying the dumb tax. Or somebody's had, had a piece of property for decades and, and you're not quite sure what to do. And I, I can't tell you how many times I go to somebody's place. They've had it three or four years. They built a pond on it. They want to know how to make it better. And we sit down around the campfire and we pop open a beer or pour a glass of wine or some iced tea. And they'll say, Bob, I'm so glad you're here. Can't wait to hear what you think. I wish I'd have done this different. I hear that over and over and over. And what that typically means to me is when somebody did something different, they paid for it. It came right out of their back pocket. So it hit me years ago that part of my job is to help teach people and educate people, give them ideas, cause them to think, and help them figure out what questions to ask. It's not so much that I'm going to try to shove a bunch of information down somebody's throat. It's I'm going to try to help somebody learn enough about it so they know what to ask about their circumstance, their land, and their goals and mission. You know, so on this, on this uh, Pond Boss Institute of Higher Pondology video series, that's to help people not pay the dumb tax so bad. So, let's see here. Let's see what we got here. Tom Melvin, two years ago I was given sole rights to a 70-year-old, seven-acre neglected retention pond, beavers, maybe otters, half his lily pads, dark water, and stocked from the 50s to the 80s. What are your thoughts when the fish in July, June, and August stop biting? Tom in Central Virginia. Um, what do I think when they stop biting? I'm gonna say a 70 year old, 70 acre lake that's been neglected, otters, beavers, lily pads, dark water, is there's a whole lot of reasons those fish won't bite. And I'm gonna tell you that they're very likely distressed because the water's not happy. And if they're being chased by otters, then they're more worried about being alive than growing. And if they were stocked in the 50s to the 80s, then that lake has aged over a long period of time, and it very likely is toward the end of its life. And if it's toward the end of its life, it's not going to be as productive as a fishery because it's too busy growing lily pads and, and, and having really green water. So I would, I would recommend that, you're, that you, should, you have that thing... Um, evaluated. And I would tell you to go to the Palm Boss Resource Guide as well. There's three or four companies that can come pay you a visit and help you assess. So here's the way I would do that. You know what your goals are. And if you don't think about that, how would you like it to be? Then you need to have it evaluated to see the status of it. Is it really heavily silted? Can the lily pads be managed? What's the fishery like? Is it dynamic or is it static? You know, is it reached its equilibrium or is it declining? You know, evaluate those things. Then you can come up with a game plan as to what to do about it. So figure out your goals, assess, and then after you assess, work with your fisheries guy, your uh, pond management company, to create a game plan to help get you from where you are to where you want to be. That's how I would approach that. James Allen, Kentucky Fisheries, growing stock trout in some lakes to encourage your winter fishing season. We don't freeze over for very long. The trout die once the lakes warm up. Is that all turtle food or do the bass benefit from that stocking? I'd like to fish trout, but I'd need another reason to justify expensive fish. Well, I'll tell you this. Bass will benefit from that if they can eat those trout. You know, so when we stock trout in the wintertime, what, what our goal is is to feed selective sizes of bass. So if we don't really want to feed 12 to 14 inch bass, so we don't stock any six to eight inch trout. So we may stock eight to 10 inch trout to feed the three to five pound bass. Or we might stock 10 to 12 inch trout that we can catch to feed the five to seven pound bass or five to eight pound bass. So it kind of depends on the mission. Um, now, what happens is uh, like in your latitude in Kentucky, you can probably stock them right after Thanksgiving and they're gonna thrive and be moving around really, really well till the middle or latter part of April. And then they're gonna to start to get real, real sluggish. And at that point, the bass are gonna devour them if they, if they can eat them. And then right around Memorial Day weekend, that's about the time you can say adios to the trout. Then any that are left, they're gonna be turtle food. They're not gonna float. Typically they don't. Every once in a while they do, but not, not really. Let's see. 
Um, let's see what you got here. It's not letting me look at the reply where you replied to yourself. Finally, and by the way, after six weeks, I found finally able to get the large. Okay, feeding big first. Let's. Okay, I'm. I'm not. I can't read this, and it's not letting me open it up. So I don't know. I don't know what you're saying there. Yeah, it's not letting me look at it. Okay, let's see here. I'm gonna move on. Mark Durham, we at Lake Wildwood are about only 50 miles north of Peoria. Grab your pole and swing by. The pre-fall smallmouth bites on, bites on. Four to five pounds are not uncommon. They can tell you about largemouth bass fishing. Very cool. That's great. Kendall Brown, look out, Bob. Yeah, we're, we've been dodging. That storm's pretty much passed now. I can see it. Okay, Kevin Hobbs, I have a one-acre pond that averages 12 feet deep. I run my aerator from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Is this okay? If not, why not? Kevin, I don't know where you are, but here's here's going to be, here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, running it from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., as long as you're not in a hot part of the country, that's fine. If you're in a hot part of the country, I'd rather see you run it from like 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. because that way you're still moving the water, helping destratify the lake but you're not influencing the temperature by the hottest part of the day. And I don't know what kind of fish you've got. If you've got largemouth bass and you're aerating from, from uh, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., then you're letting that water contact the, 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 the atmosphere and the heat, and you're heating that water column up. So if you're uh, north of the Mason-Dixon line, you're fine. If you're in Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, I'd rather see you do it the other way around. Okay, Al says, I know the area. I live in Rochester. Our cabin and, and pond is in the south, south town of Canandaigua Lake. Yeah, that's beautiful country. I love it. James Allen, wife works for a builder. Women are responsible for an average of 70000 additional costs after the build starts. Do not ever say that in front of my wife. <laughs> We've got a budget. She's doing a pretty good job holding to it, but we're not going to hold to it. No pond moss. Got to go chase some money here before long. Kevin Hobb, Central Kentucky. Thanks, largemouth bass and bluegill. All right. Okay, so uh, if you got more questions, throw them at me. Uh, oh, here we go. Alan Willoughby, I have a half-acre pond that stays covered with duckweed all summer. How can I get rid of it? I'll tell you what. Here's, what I'm, I'm gonna, here's my general answer to everybody about aquatic plants nowadays. I'd love to sit here and assess those plants and tell you what to do about it. Well, job one is you got to identify the plant. And if you know what duckweed is and you see it, you know it then you can decide what to do about it. There is a website, Aqua Plant, <coughs> at uh, Texas A&M. And not only th th does it have pictures of almost all the common plants, it also has a section in there that tells you your different choices on how to deal with them. You know, like duckweed, you can use clipper. You can use glyphosate if you do it right. You can use uh, fluoridone, you know, or you can scoop them off in the springtime before they get out of hand. Now, let me tell you a little bit about duckweed. Duckweed is really peaking out right now. Now, you guys, all y'all probably heard this before, but if somebody gave you a choice between a million dollars in your hand or a penny doubled every day for 30 days, take the penny. That's duckweed. So duckweed reproduces about every 48 hours in warm weather. So what that means, if you start out with one, then you get two, then you get four, then you eight, 16, 32, and you do that for about 30 or 40 days, and you got 6 million of the little plants. Well, that's duckweed. So right now, it's at its peak. Now, when winter comes along, depending on where you are, because, Alan, I'm not quite sure where you are, uh, once winter comes, it will dissipate, and a lot of it will go away. But not all of it will die. You know, what can die will die. What freezes will freeze. But typically, if it's growing where you are, it can make it through the winter because it ends up somewhere where it doesn't get killed. You know, and so when you first see it in the spring, that's when you need to get it before it starts doing that, that double number by about day 30 because that's when it really gets out of hand. Now, if you want to do something about it now because it's so dense, go to Aquaplant. I think Aquaplant. Dot, I don't know. Just look up Aquaplant, Texas A&M. It's going to take you to it. And then you look at the plant, identify it, and then look at the management options. And it'll tell you if there's any physical options. It'll tell you if there's any biological options. Then it's going to give you the choices that you can have about what kind of a herbicide to use on it. And those are all approved herbicides by EPA. 
So take a look at that. Okay, now, James Allen, I lived in Rochester for 60 years. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, I tell you, um, I've been to 49 states. I haven't been to Delaware. You really have to have a reason to go to Delaware, and I haven't had a reason yet. And out of all the states I've been, every state has its own beauty. You know, every one of them is, it has something that's gorgeous. You know, but if I had to pick one state that I thought was the most gorgeous, it would be, it would be upstate New York. Now, I wouldn't give you a nickel for that little tip down there, that little island thingy that influences way too many people, but I love upstate New York. You go, you got the Finger Lakes, you've got Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, you've got the Catskills, the Adirondacks, you know, you've got great area where grapes grow, you got area where corn grows, you got apple orchards, you know, uh, every species of fish, the Erie Canal, you know, I've never seen a state with the diversity of fishing that upstate New York has got. And it's just, it's amazing to me. And the beauty is just the fall colors. I don't know that there's a prettier place. I'm sure there may be, but I've seen some gorgeous falls up there. And I, and I, I do love upstate New York. I, I hate that they have to deal with the politics they have to deal with, but I love that state. It's beautiful. I don't ever talk about politics. Chris, you've been in New York. They're going to let you back into Texas. I'm not there now. <laughs> I'm in Illinois. I'm hanging out west of Peoria in Hannah City. There, Chris. Um, okay, Melvin Bolton. I have a half acre pond that is 22 feet deep in eastern North Dakota. We have harsh winters. Yes, you do. Is it better for me to keep the snow off of the blade or run a pump or aerator at the end of the pond? That is a great question. Melvin, I love that. So it sounds to me like you have a pothole which is a natural lake. I doubt that you've dammed it up. Tell me if you did. Um, is it better to keep, the, you know what? I don't, I don't know. I don't know enough about ice to, other than to tell you this. What causes winter kill is consumption of oxygen faster than oxygen can be regenerated. There's only two ways oxygen gets into water. One is through photosynthesis from existing plants. Now, not all plants die in the wintertime. So if you've got clear ice where you can have photosynthesis, your plants are gonna generate some oxygen. If your ice isn't clear, it doesn't matter how much snow's on top of it. So that takes me to the other one. If you have a, a pump or an aerator on the end of the pond, now as cold as you get, one of the risks you're gonna have with an aerator is condensation getting into the line going to the diffuser. And if you get condensation in that line, it's going to freeze and then it won't work. But one thing about being cautious with aeration in a northern pond is you do want to have it in shallow water. You don't want it out in the very middle where it's cranking up. You know, your warm water there is going to be on the bottom. Water is just most dense at 40, 39 degrees. If you weigh one gallon of water at 39 degrees, it's the heaviest it's gonna be. Cooler than that, it expands, it weighs less. Warmer than that, it expands, it weighs less. So what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna have your aeration in the deeper water where it's pushing up your, your thermal refuge for all your fish, pushing it to the top and making a hole in the water, or a hole in the ice, so that the water gets too cold because you can kill your fish that way. But what you can do is you can move diffusers in a 22 acre lake up to the shallow end. And if, if, if it'll let you keep a hole open and if you don't get condensation in there, then you can aerate the upper end and keep a hole open there. Now here's, here's the deal. You gotta think about eye safety. What you don't want is you don't want an animal that gets out there and then can't, get, can't come out of the lake, you know, or something like that. So you wanna keep, if you're gonna keep an area open so you can keep it oxygenated, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with an aeration system uh, as long as you understand that your, that your hose is gonna to have to be at an angle. It can't run up and down because if it's looped, you know, if it, if it goes up, then down, then back up, condensation is gonna gather in the bottom of that thing and then it's gonna freeze up and block your, block your hose. 
Now that's, nobody tells you that. See, that's premium content. You just got that right here. So uh, if I was going to lean one toward the other, I'd say if you have clear ice and you can scrape the snow off of it, that would be fine. Odds are not. Odds are high that you won't have clear ice. So in that case, if you want to aerate at the end of the lake, don't do it in the middle. Do it at the end. Now, those diffusers, now before you put in an aeration system, talk to the manufacturer because bottom diffused aeration works in water a minimum depth. So you've got to have it at least that depth, which may be four feet, maybe five feet. So I would check all that out before you, uh, before you buy a system. All right, so uh, holy cow, it's already 725, so we might be getting ready to kind of wrap it up. Um, I think I pretty well covered the topic like I wanted to that Jeff and I talked about. I did want to do a little shout out to Troy Earhart. Troy said he was going to be checking in tonight. I didn't see him, but Troy said he was going to be watching the show tonight and tell him hello, which, hello, Troy. He's the guy building our uh, swimming pool out behind the house down there. All right, Melvin, you are welcome for that answer. So listen, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. This storm is about past. I get to go back out to the Giant Goose Ranch, hang out in a cabin out there. Y'all look up Giant Goose Ranch in uh, uh, Illinois. It's a pretty dead gum amazing place. Uh, the, the Hermans, I remember before they even got into the fisheries business, Nate came to a Palm Boss conference like 2000, let's see, Gentry's 12, so it would have been like 2007. Maybe something like that. And, uh, uh, and then they kicked in gear, and before long, they have their own TV show. They they did Lake Life on the DIY channel, I think, for two or three years. Had a series there. The super, super people. I see Jerry Siebert checking in from Oregon. I love, I love looking on here and seeing people from all over the nation, from both coasts and all the states in between. I uh, appreciate the support. I'm so glad you're here. You know, like I've told you before, I think one of my roles, part of the reason God put me on this earth is to learn this stuff and then share it with you. So uh, I'm thrilled to death that this many people would actually be watching a 66-year-old overweight fish guy talking about this stuff. So I appreciate you guys checking in and watching. So uh, I'm not sure where I'll be next Wednesday. I'll be somewhere. Might be in the RV. I don't know. Might be down at Running River Ranch. Our house still isn't ready to live in yet, but we're getting closer. So... Uh, if you have more questions, holler, check in, pondboss.com. Lots of information there, lots of free articles, a lot of free videos. We archive these videos as well on YouTube, and then we link to them from the Palm Boss website. So uh, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. I'm going to go see if I can find a sandwich and head to Giant Goose Ranch. So until next Wednesday.